You're listening to Focus on Utilities, brought to you by Power and Utilities Australia, the disruptor platform for Australia's utilities undergoing transition. Join us each month as we bring together diverse and divergent voices from the energy sector to unpack some of the key challenges and opportunities facing energy networks as they transition towards net zero. Happy New Year to our listeners and anyone that might be dropping in to have a a little uh, listen to the podcast this month. Uh, And welcome to our latest podcast from Focus on Utilities, presented by Power and Utilities Australia Leadership Summit, which takes place, of course, here in Melbourne from the 7th to the 8th of May. I'm Paul Mathers, Event Director for Power and Utilities Australia, and this is the third in our series of pods on energy transition for utilities. We kick off the new year with a discussion on energy equity and the role of government, tariff reform and importantly bringing customers on the transition journey because I think we can can face the facts that the energy transition has been anything but smooth and although we often talk about customers leading the transition through adoption of CER for instance, we still find ourselves amidst a cost of living crisis, rising energy bills differing opinions about the role of gas and debate around social licence. So we ask, what more needs to be done to put the customer at the centre of the energy transition? Do consumers at all levels understand the role they have to play? Are large energy users genuinely engaged? And what can utilities do to bring everyone on the journey? Joining this month's Brains Trust is my co-host, David Prins, Director of Etrog Consulting. David, who you have some experience around some of these questions. You're a regular at conferences around the country. Good to see you, David. Thanks. Uh, It's very good to be here. Just uh, just for context, David, tell us a little bit quickly about Etrog Consulting. Um, Yes, Etrog Consulting um, is a specialist consultancy based in Melbourne. Uh, We specialise in energy utilities, looking at competition and regulation and how they sit with each other, and particularly looking at things from a consumer focus. And these days we're particularly looking at the energy transition, so very, very relevant to uh, today's talk. David, you and I work quite closely on the advisory board for Power and Utilities Australia, and I know you're a champion for consumers. Uh, You're always pressing those topics, and uh, and we're really pleased to have you on board to co-host this session. Also joining us is Charlotte Eddy. Charlotte's had 11 years at Ausnet uh, in various regulatory roles. She's the General Manager of Regulation and Policy for Distribution and Ausnet Services. Welcome, Charlotte. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. And Gavin Dufty, also Executive General Manager, Policy and Research at St Vincent de Paul Society. 21 years of service there, Gavin. You're at old hand, aren't you? Uh, yeah, it's been around a bit. <laughs> That's great. Well, look, let's get straight into it, shall we? This conversation around the customer, bringing the customer with us on the energy transition, it reminds me of a quote from Animal Farm that all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And David, we hear a lot about this energy transition being driven by customers, but surely some customers must be more capable of that than others. How does that impact on energy equity and achieving a just transition? And look, that's a key question that needs to be resolved. There are so many different things happening, and they're all happening, uh, it seems uh, to me, from the focus of the people driving it. Governments have an agenda. Uh, The market operator has an agenda. Retailers and distribution businesses and generators. And sometimes uh, it feels like customers are collateral damage, and we need to be better focused, not just on saying that customers are driving and customers are the focus, but really putting that in practice. Yeah, I'd like to uh, get Gavin and Charlotte's thoughts on uh, how the energy customers can be part of the transition and how we can get a just transition. Perhaps go to Gavin first. A a really great question, David. I think that there's a lot of um, structural changes that need to happen within the regulatory framework. Um, We have got a system that's been designed for a vertically type uh, market, um, big stuff coming through transmission lines, through distribution lines to households, one-way flows, with 
significant investments households have made in new appliances such as photovoltaics, we get electric vehicles are on their way, we've got home batteries, a whole lot of other stuff. That's more of a horizontal type market where, where flows are much more local. Um, the reg frameworks don't recognise that or support those investments. I also think regulators, particularly those who are looking to protect vulnerable people, don't understand that households with more appliances actually have more agency, not less. Um, so why should we protect people which have more agency and more optionality to move around either production or consumption? So for me, I think uh, the regulatory frameworks are part of the problem here. They play to incumbency and we need to sort of deal with those sorts of things. And I, I know that's one of the challenges that Charlotte's having within the distribution network and, and the next EDPR. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gavin. There's a couple of elements, I think, to unpack around a just transition. And one is cost and different costs and benefits that customers can face um, in their electricity bills. But also there's another element around service levels. And at the moment, there's quite a big disparity between the reliability and resilience outcomes on the network, for example, between our regional and metro customers. And that's the way that the framework was designed for good reason at the time. Uh, but now we're in a world where we're wanting customers to use the network in a fundamentally different way and for networks to uh, be able to accommodate EVs and DER. And um, I think that will really test the bounds of what is an acceptable level of service for customers who currently have poorer service levels. And we need to be able to facilitate their transition um, to their part of the transition and their electrification journeys, as well as our customers in more stronger parts of the network. There's two parts of that conversation, cost and service, that you mentioned there, Charlotte. And uh, I've touched on... A, uh, the St Vincent de Paul report into the electricity market recently, Gavin, which said that power and gas prices rose in every state in 2023. Not everyone can afford the energy transition, can they, from a consumer point of view? Um, not everyone has access or can afford to have access to clean energy technology. Um, and the cost of green, green schemes recovered through energy bills generally and are not really shared evenly. Are they? No, no. and that, that, that's a legacy issue of the old vertically integrated market where there was a lot of homogeneity and we all probably used energy pretty well similarly, had similar sorts of consumption. So when you start to put you know, screen schemes, for example, in on consumption based, it gets pretty well smeared and then the complementary measures sort of deal with the equity issues like the concessions. Now, with behind the meter investments with, you know, generation photovoltaics, perfect examples, bit of home batteries, whatever, you've got a whole lot of people that are reducing their consumption significantly, offsetting that with feed-in tariffs. Those fixed green schemes costs get reallocated to those without those opportunities to do it. So the costs are fixed, but the pool of people that are bearing those cost burdens is reducing. It's a wealth issue because households with wealth, a home effectively, are the ones that are investing in all these new kit and, and they tend to be older, me, built my worth, wealth on carbon. Um, and those costs are being allocated to younger people who tend to be renters and, and they have less wealth. They also actually haven't had a bigger carbon footprint as well. So it's quite regressive temporally as well from a wealth point of view. Uh, and again, it's a legacy issue of the old market that looked at investments and everything over a 60-year-old period vertically integrated rather than a horizontal-type framework. And the situation is even different when you're talking about remote Indigenous communities too, isn't it, who are very disadvantaged? Oh, look, it's, it's everywhere. You know, as metro versus non-metro, you've got dual fuel households, a big deal in Victoria, versus all electric households. And how is that transition if we're going to electrify everything? You've got, you can see it with EVs, you know, people with on-street parking are going to have a different outcome than people with garages where they can charge internally. And so networks have got to deal with all those sorts of things. It's a fundamental change. Thank you, Gavin. Um, maybe pass to Charlotte again now. Uh, talk about um, there's an upcoming um, distribution price review uh, from 2026. What are the opportunities there to change, to highlight um, and to fix some of the issues that we have with the regulatory framework and its application and to get better energy equity? Thanks, David. We're, so we're deep in discussion with our customers around our price review for the 26 to 31 regulatory periods. We're due to submit that proposal to the AAR in January 2025. 
There's a number of things that we're looking at in our conversations with customers. Firstly, there's opportunity for tariff reform, uh, building in periods in the day where it is cheaper to use energy, uh, to encourage customers to use their, um, use their excess solar, their own solar, but also other customers' solar, could be something we could do to assist customers reduce their bills, even if they do, don't have solar systems themselves. Um, that needs to be complemented with communications. We're finding in a lot of our conversations that customers are unaware of when it would be best for them to use their energy to reduce their bills. And that's a conversation between distributors and retailers on how we can best um, produce that comms for customers. There's other things we're looking at in terms of disparity in service levels. We're conducting a lot of customer research to really quantify um, the benefits of increasing um, reliability and also the savings for reducing reliability, if that's the right answer, in the context of the transition to inform our investment cases. And as an example, um, we had long outages just before Christmas in November and December. We had 13,000 customers off supply in the northeast of the state. And following those prolonged outages, we did some research um, that was actually really fascinating. Uh, we had 500 customers respond, and seven out of 10 of those customers said that reliability will become more important in the future. Only 1% of those customers said it will become less important to them in the future. And then we found some really big differences between the costs or the losses that customers experience depending on whether they're an all-electric connection or an electricity and mains gas connection. Electricity customers spent on average $1,100 to um, respond to that outage. Whereas if they had gas, that amount was reduced to $360, which is a huge gap and really illustrates the challenge, I think, for the electricity distribution network in sort of re-establishing what is an acceptable level of service that will really gain the social license for, dis for customers to progress with the electricity transition. Those numbers would suggest to me that there's actually a strong case for staying on gas for a lot of people. Well, I think um, the policy direction when it comes to gas in residential properties is pretty clear. I think the challenge is how we um, make the transition from an electricity perspective as smooth as possible and really get the benefits of potentially reducing costs overall as the um, volume of electricity that's consumed uh, goes up. Yeah, thanks. I was going to ask Gavin, um, Charlotte referred to educating customers. Do you think that customers need to be ec educated and is that what's missing um, in making sure we have a just transition or are there other more important factors that, that need to be resolved? Thanks for the question, David. Oh, look, education is a part of the transition, but it's not everything um, I've seen in the past. Um, education is often used as a tool to blame people for the situations that they're in. Um, I think that there needs to be a whole lot of a bigger fundamental framework changing. Um, Charlotte's mentioned daytime savers, sun soaker type tariffs. We, we do need to have injection or export pricing as well, tariffs, reward and penalty for those that are putting stuff into the grid or taking it out of the grid. That will support an orderly transition for electric vehicle charging and dispatching and home batteries and a whole lot of other things. Once we've got those frameworks, then we do need simple messaging to households about how they can optimise their, their position rather than educating them to about, you know, shop around and you'll save. That, that, that's, you know, that's simplistic, I think. And we've got, we know that education works well. People still think off-peak is between 11 o'clock at night and 7 mm -hmm. in the morning. It's not. Off-peak's been between 10 in, the, 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. So it's, it shouldn't be too hard to get people around on that. But to do that, we need the pricing frameworks to support that education and we need to make sure that those changes are there for a long period of time and it's structural and it's fixed. Because once you educate people, they'll start to behave like that. Um, changing those learnt behaviours quickly is not possible. 
Yeah, I just want to touch on that because these daytime tariffs that you know, we're encouraged to, to use electricity during the daytime. They traditionally fall at a time when people are at work, right? So, so and I, I acknowledge that that is changing, that whole work dynamic is changing. More people are working from home on certain days of the week or even all the time. But how practical is it really for the average Joe and Jane? I'll just um, jump in there. 30% of households in Victoria or nationally are actually on healthcare cards or pension cards. Disability pensioners, age pensioners, unemployed people, single parents, they're at home during the day. Often most, a lot of them are in rental properties. They've got load in abundance. And to give them free stuff is a really good equity outcome and it improves utilisation. So it goes to the right people is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, Great. and support solar. So households, I need a market to sell my injections to because I'm solar. So there's a win-win here. Share the love. I, you know, I look at distribution networks as matchmakers. How do they match make local energy production to consumption? Absolutely. And I think um, it, it, there's currently customers that are home in the day and do have the opportunity to shift load, but they, there isn't the education or they are under the impression that actually the best thing for them is to maximise their feed-in tariff credit because it's a credit and actually pumping out solar into the grid is a good thing for the system overall. And I think some messaging that's really targeted on how um, they can use their own renewable and that would be better both for them and for overall system costs will be really important to change that behaviour. Do I have to start having my dinner at three o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, <laughs> or doing the laundry? Well, well, if you're home, you can. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I actually prepare my, my... I use my oven during the day and then reheat later on. But, you know, I'm a bit weird. But... Well, well you've, you've, you've adopted the new paradigm. But it is a new paradigm, isn't it, for, for a lot of people... Yeah, and we don't need everybody to do the same things at the same time. You just blow up the system. So, you know, if, if there's people that have the opportunity in the day to consume in the day, it supports solar, it gets greater utilisation of the network, lower unit costs for everybody, win-win. And it's giving customers the choice. Uh, if they shift, then they can get a reward by way of lower bills. But we've also got to look for the, at the impacts of those customers who are unable or unwilling to um, respond to those pricing structures. Yeah, look, there's obviously a lot of customers who are very engaged to embrace change. When there's a change, will say, well, how can I react to that? But a lot of customers, as you said, Gavin, they still think that um, overnight is off peak. They haven't got to where we are now. You're talking about further tariff reform. If they're already one step behind, how do we expect them to cope with, uh, with further change in the future? Uh, look, I, I think we, we can learn a lot from the water industry. I sit on Yarra Valley Water's Customer Council, and when we, when we had um, water scarcity, you know, there was public messaging that went out, you know, don't hose down your car and wash your car and do all that. That messaging stuck really well. We're still practising those behaviours. If we can do it in water, we can do it in electricity. It's, it, it needs the government to actually start to step in and, and talk about how to do it. It needs networks to back it in. And it, I don't think it's that hard. And as I said, water's done it before. And at OzNet, we've just launched our We Bring the Energy brand campaign into the market, which is focused on letting our customers know who we are and what our role is in the transition. And that's with the expectation that as the transition progresses, we'll be having more to do with our customers and landholders um, than we have previously. That's really interesting because you mentioned the government, um, Gavin, and you say what you're doing there with, with OzNet. What's the role of government and what's the role of utilities in this in this equation? Because I think that they each have different roles, but they've all got really key roles and they've got to work together in order to get the messaging and the habits changing and, and so on. I, th I, think, I, th I think we're at this inflection point from the old market where the role was shop around and get a deal because it was vertically integrated to a horizontal market. And... And not everybody's across to the horizontal market yet, and some are still stuck in the vertical. And the role of government is to say, right, we've switched now. We're in the new market. We've, we've, we've got our emissions targets. We're going to get net zero by 2040, 2050, whatever it is. These are the foundational changes that we are supporting through regulation and changes that the distribution networks are making. This is your new off-peak time. This is where the opportunity is. This is how we're going to move into the new future. And, and they do need to do it now. The longer you leave, leave it, the less opportunity and value, as you mentioned, because it is about value. Value is lost. The inference there is that government's not doing enough right now. No, 
No, they're too timid. And, and you know, you'd, you've got to go out on a limb to get the fruit. You, yeah. you don't sit underneath the tree. It's just going to hit you on the head. So they do need to start to move. I think um, a key thing that uh, caused the water industry to be a success was that, was that it was about community good. It wasn't about each person's own vested interests. And I think there's another key thing there, which is what I call the big T word, which is trust. People trusted the messaging they were getting through in the water industry from the state government. Nowadays, we're told zero trust. Don't trust anything. It could be a spam, a scam. It's trying to steal your details. It's telling you a load of rubbish. A lot of what is on social media will tell you what to do, and it won't, it's not good for you at all. How do we, maybe ask Charlotte first, how do you get around this uh, trust issue? How do we make That's sure that we get the right uh, messages through that people really believe and want to act on? It's a great question, David. And I, I think trust takes time. Building trust takes time. And it's something that um, we need to be um, out there more communicating with customers to sort of build that trust. So it's, it's, it's difficult. I think working as an industry rather than as parts of the industry is quite key to that as well, because that means that customers have more consistency in the messaging that they're hearing. I, th I think part of the solution is have many voices with a similar message. People choose who their trust is. I mean, Vinnies, we're one of the one of one charity. Not everybody comes to the Vinnies. Some prefer the Sallys, some prefer to others. People trust particular voices. So having many voices on board that are saying the same thing, I think you'll build overall trust because one voice will only appeal to a small group of people and that's where you start to get that erosion, not everybody's on board. Yeah, it's often been said that trust is something that takes a long time to build but it's very easy to lose very quickly and I agree with that. Is, are the right resources being put into the customer voice? Oh, resourcing, you could always deal with more resourcing, definitely. Um, I, I think... I th I think what we've lost, and, and, and this is where the networks need to be congratulated, I, I think, I, I come from a member-based organisation, strength is in the community and strength is local. If you fund one voice, like a peak body or whatever, it actually doesn't result in structural change, it might have political change, but we're looking for structural change and communities being involved and engaged. So I think anything that can bring the message locally and create local conversations which the networks are doing will drive the change and will will deliver what people want rather than gatekeepers and some would say Vinnie's is a gatekeeper what their view of the world is um, and at Osnet we are heavily investing in customer engagement and hearing the customer voice but also in customer research to get that really broad based quantitative data set to inform our plans that then will be tested um, with our customer advocates and the customer voice. So I think there's, there are heavy investments happening across the distribution network and that's absolutely critical um, to inform what distributors do and invest in beyond regulatory submissions, how customers use the network is changing rapidly and we need to be ahead of um, that change. A lot of the time, the interface between the customer, though, and, and energy is the retailer, though, isn't it? Because that's who they pay the bills to. And I want to quote um, Dr. Brendan French from a recent ABC article saying, many people are paying double what they were paying 12 years ago, so you'd expect there to be far more innovation at a retail level. And I'll be honest, we're disappointed that we're not seeing more of it. What's missing at the retail level? Oh, Lots. I mean, we spent two and a half billion dollars in smart meters in Victoria this ten years ago. We really haven't optimised that investment, which household plays for. Um, I think retailers are probably the incumbent retailers are probably protecting their wholesale portfolio. I mean, they've got big, expensive assets down in the Latrobe Valley and all over the place. Um, you'd want to sweat them for as long as you can to get value. So, why would you cannibalise your own portfolio and start to lift up value of consumer resources? So that's one thing. I also think the regulatory framework plays to incumbency. It hasn't changed, and it is there based on the assumption that the value is in coal pits and big stuff out all over the place. So. Again, it's an inflection point. 
Thanks. I'd like to develop further what you talked about, the importance of consistent messaging, um, because I feel as a consumer that I'm not getting consistent messaging. I'm telling Oh, put solar on your roof, it's great. Oh, no, no, solar's calling a big problem for the network. I'm hearing um, oh, the energy transition will move to free renewable energy, but I'm seeing billion, millions, billions, trillions being spent, and as you say, bills going up. What can we do, and perhaps ask Charlotte first, what can we do to keep messaging more consistent? Oh, that's a very difficult question, David. Um, it... it it's really hard because the industry is so complex and your average customer doesn't spend a lot of time really trying to understand the energy industry quite rightly. Um, they see the media headlines that can be jarring and inconsistent to them. I, it, it's a really complex issue that we need to be working through, I think, with government and with other parts of the industry and with um, customer organisations like Gavin's. Oh, honesty. Um, we were sold. Solar was sold on a return, like, a, a, and a financial investment. It has so many other value with it. It improves my capital, improved value of my home, a whole lot of things. I think they went simple selling, and the honesty of the thing is the old energy system needs to be replaced. It's going to be expensive to do it, but we will all benefit in the long term. It is in the long-term interest of all of us. And, and people, people will run with that. They say, yeah, of course it's got to be changed. Of course it will cost us. And then it's about how those costs are shared and how those costs are allocated. And that's the conversation that we're not having. It's about who pays, how and when. And that's why tariff reform and a whole lot of other things are really important because it deals with that, the transitional cost issues. So what do you think, let, I mean, this is a bit of blue, blue sky thinking, but what do you think that the, the energy system looks like for consumers in the next 10 years? Higher levels of engagement. Um, customers will be, I expect, more aware of their pricing signals and be responding more to signals that are sent by networks and also and subsequently by retailers. Um, more customers will be electrified, so they'll be using the system in very different ways. Uh, and the system will be supporting that use. And that could be a build out of network. It could be non-network solutions where they're a better, um, a better economic proposition. There could, there's a lot that needs to happen over the next 10 years. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I support that. I think it'll be a plug and play network. I look at the internet, you plug, you know, whether it's Mac, IBM, whatever, it plugs in, works it all out and you extract the value you want from it, or, or third parties actually extract value on your behalf. Those in a traditional market, there's a place for them, just, you know, that, that's right, 10 to 4, switch on appliances, you're good to go, but others that have got a more sophisticated framework, they'll be able to optimise it, and we'll all value, value from that. And what should that relationship look like between utilities and customers? It's got to be symbiotic, and increasingly... Um, distributors need to really be understanding household behaviour to be able to anticipate where electrification is going to occur and um, how the customers are going to use the system to inform our investment plans to make sure that social licence for electrification and the transition is upheld because customers aren't buying their EV and then unable to use it as they want to. Um, and likewise, utilities customers will have a better understanding of the grid and when they should be using their energy as well. It's, a, it's a more of a two-way symbiotic relationship than it has been in the past. I agree. I think it's a culture change is needed. Utilities need to stop doing things to people. We're going to do this for you. We're going to send this bill to you. And doing things for people. We, we, we can lift up and reduce better value in your appliances, make your life better, easier, all those sorts of things. Moving from a goods market to a service market, that would be another way to put it. We're offering services to you. David, what do you think? Um, look, I think there's a lot of challenges um, ahead of us, uh, and the future is now. And um, all these uh, parties have a, thing, have a role to play. I think the key one that I come back to is, is going to be trust. 
is going to be that, yes, everybody needs to work together, everybody needs to help each other. We need to have re legislative regulatory frameworks that work, um, and we need to have the right investments, uh, um, given the right incentives. But at the end of the day, none of that will help us if we're all too worried about our own position and cost of living problems, and are we going to survive, and we retreat into our own little space. And we, that happens because we don't trust that actually, together, we'll produce a much better outcome. So, Gavin, if there was one message that you wanted people to leave this podcast with from today, what would that be? Doing nothing is an op not an option, and we need to do it yesterday. Looking at equity in terms of both cost equity and also service level equity. Um, I think that what I want people to take away is that we're all part of one big community and we have to solve this problem together. Usually people are asked to look at, well, what's best for me? What's the best outcome for me? No, we've got to change from that thinking. Well, thank you. I, I, that's all really good stuff. I, I've learned a lot today and I hope that our listeners have. Um, thanks to our guests, Charlotte Eddy and Gavin Dufty, and of course, my co-host, David Prins. I'm sure what we've discussed today will spark some conversation and possibly debate. So feel free to engage with us on our Power and Utilities Australia LinkedIn stream or... Even better, register now to join us at the Leadership Summit in May at powerutilitiesaustralia.com. Um, more interesting co uh, content coming up next month, so watch this space. But in the meantime, be sure to link to us on LinkedIn. We hope to see you in person in May. I'm Paul Mathers. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Focus on Utilities, brought to you by Power and Utilities Australia, the disruptor platform for Australia's utilities undergoing transition. Join us in person at the Power and Utilities Australia Leadership Summit and Expo in Melbourne, 7th to 8th of May 2024.